Our greatest journey is not conquering the mountains, the sea or space, it's to become fully alive, to have faced adversity and mowed it down, to have stood still in the face of our monsters and watched as they vanish poof, into the ether. And it's this journey that calls to the hero within every single one of us, heroes like Jamie Kerstetter. Jamie is a poker player foremost and turned broadcaster who has commentated on tours as luminous as the World Series of Poker, including the main event. And she's currently the co-host of Run It Once, The Rake Podcast. Okay, so without further ado, I'm going to shut the hell up and leave you in the capable hands of Jamie Kerstetter. Jamie Kerstetter, welcome to The Hero's Journey. How's life? Oh, thank you. Uh, it's really good. Do you know, I haven't seen you face to face in a decade, I think. Uh, I think you interviewed yeah. me at PCA like so long ago when I was a little baby poker player. <laughs> was it, do you know the memory I have is actually Venice? Oh, wow. Well, yeah, that was a while ago, too. Maybe seven years then. Something it like was that. your, I think it was your first trip to Venice and you were mm -hmm. representing Party Poker who were affiliated with the World Poker Tour at the time. Yep. That trip was yeah. awesome. That's probably Over my favorite book trip of all time. Was that the one? Was that the one where Dynamo was at? I mean, we were we seem to be at Venice every freaking like twice a year, but there was one where Magician Dynamo was there. Was that the year? <laughs> that wasn't my year. I think uh, the year I went, the time I went was with Kara Scott also, and there were like naked people laying on tables with sushi on them. I'm like, where am I? <laughs> at the uh, place party. <laughs> that was the days before the WPT um, cuts. Operational cuts. <laughs> you see on naked people. Do you know, I always used to skip parties. So they, I only ever went to very few of them. I went to. Oh, them, really? Yeah. Well, I don't drink. So I don't like being around drunk people. They get on my tits. So yeah, um, I feel that. Yeah. <laughs> I, went to, I went to the one in Venice because um, Dynamo was there, the magician. That was like an okay. amazing thing. But yeah, her man's bloom was always pestering me to go to the meetings, but I would never <laughs> ever go there. What what is um what is the one thing about poker? So for me, like, you know, I was never a poker player, but you know, working in the industry, I never wanted to go to these parties, but I was always told that I had to, right? What what is it about poker? What is your have to's in poker that really goes against the grain that you, you have to do, but you don't want to do? Oh man, that's a good question. Um well, there were a lot of have tos when I was a sponsored player, but now I feel like not as many. <laughs> like I'm thinking of what do I really have to do? I don't have to wake up early. I don't, you know, you have to just you have to manage yourself, you have to study and and make good use of your time and not overspend. But really, like what else do I have to do as a poker player? It's <laughs> the beauty of <laughs> that why is that why you chose the the art, is it the the freedom of it all? Oh, for sure. I, I think that's something I still appreciate. I'm happy I was a lawyer at first because it made me really appreciate having my own schedule and not answering to people, not having your weekend ruined by uh, an inconsiderate boss just throwing stuff at your desk Friday afternoon. Um, I still think about that when I don't have to wake up to an alarm. I'm still like very appreciative of that. And that's 10 years later. Yeah, yeah, I think you have to fully experience that, right, in order for you to appreciate it. There's a lot of people in poker who just went straight from school to poker mm -hmm. that have never even had a job, you know. Um, <laughs> and and uh, I, I think for me, the fear of having a job and having to go back there was what kept me going. For sure. <laughs> you know what it's like? I used to wake up at 5.30 in the morning just to be able to get half an hour at the gym or something, just to do something for myself that wasn't work. And then work really hard for sometimes like 10 or 12 hours, a job I didn't like, and then come mm. home and I think, all right, I'm going to do something fun. But then you're really tired. You don't want to do something fun. Um, you kind of just sleep and then repeat the next day. And that, I don't know, I still remember what that feels like. And it kind of makes me, it, that's what makes me want to do podcasting and, and uh, you know, I do some ghostwriting for people, things that will make me some money regardless of how poker is going to make sure that I don't have to do that again. Yeah, you've definitely diversified, and we'll, we'll touch upon that a little bit. But what what was a part of the world that you kind of grew up in, and how do you think the the environment and the culture shaped you, your early years particularly? Um, I grew up in New Jersey in like a little suburb, um, really, really boring town, um, which was okay because I was really into sports, so I didn't really need a lot of stuff going on. I was really like individually motivated to just practice soccer, go running, stuff like that. Um, I had three siblings, so we played everything together. Um, one was five years older, one was seven years older, and then I have a much younger brother. So 
I played with older kids growing up my whole life. Um, and it really, I feel like sparked my competitive nature because I never get to win, you know, <laughs> like from mm-hmm. little, I got my ass kicked at everything. We'd play soccer. I'd get to play if they needed to add an additional person. It was like seven V six, like, okay, bring in the girl. And it would be like, I'm so small. I just get knocked around. Um, but that had a huge effect on me. And I, you know, that's, I loved playing sports. And when I finally played with kids, my own size and age and gender, um, I had a huge advantage because I was just so much tougher. I was just used to getting beaten at everything. So um, and my dad was super competitive and, you know, my mom just allowed it, <laughs> allowed me to be, I don't know, somebody who played every single, everything hundred um, percent. And yeah, I would say that's, that's like the main theme of my childhood is just playing games and, and trying to beat older kids at stuff. How did that competitiveness shape you? Because I know for a fact that uh, being competitive dad myself, my son would cry when we were playing video games because, and later he would get very angry playing video games with his friends because that competitiveness actually worked against him and actually went more into a fixed mindset than a growth mindset. So how do you think it uh, affected you when you were younger? Um, I think it made me like very achievement driven. Like I wanted to win at stuff. So then the things that I was good at, I would take to those much harder than more normal people would like I was good at spelling and I'm like, I'm going to study spelling. I'm going to be good at spelling youth, that kind of thing. Instead of what do I enjoy? I'm just going to grow in the thing that I enjoy. Um, I always picked the things that I was like naturally talented at and then just Mm. went all out for those. So it's not the best because I'm like, I probably would have enjoyed playing an instrument or something. But instead I was like, okay, I I dominate at soccer and I could get an A in math class. So I'm going to do those things. Um, So I think I kind of let other interests like fall to the wayside because I wanted to win at stuff. I still, I feel like poker, I don't feel like, I'm not, I'm not the best player. I'm not even close, but I enjoy it and can make some money at it. So I feel like I've grown in that way where I'm like, I don't have to do the thing that I'm the best at right now to be happy. Mm. Yeah. I'm interested in that because there's an element of uh, you, you really played football, right? Yeah. So, so <laughs> I, I, I played football and love football when I was younger. So there was an element of, I just want to play because that's what I love to do. Mm-hmm. But there was also an element of, oh, this is how I get externally praised and rewarded and recognized. Like, where were you on that balance of I'm doing this for myself, but I'm also doing this with external for external plaudits? Yeah, I think, um, well, with sports, that, that had both. That was like the best feeling in the world because I loved it so much that I could practice five hours a day. And then like I, for in college, I did. I played two sports. I had two hours each of both. I would I'd play soccer in the morning, two hours. I'd have a quick break um, and then I'd have track practice for two hours. And mm. I loved it so much that you'd catch me at like 10 p.m. being like, I kind of want to go for a jog. I can get a couple more miles in. Um, and I would get praised for that, too, because it was like Rutgers is a really good school um, for sports. It was Division One. And people thought it was really cool. that I did that. And I'm like, wow, the thing I love doing is also the thing I get credit for. That was a great feeling. Um, I don't think that matches up for a lot of people most of the time. Um, And I actually don't have anything like that right now in my life. I think that's a little feeling of emptiness when you leave sports and you are Mm. so into it and you just feel yourself getting older and you don't really have that outlet anymore. Um, It is a little tougher now because like I I know exactly what you're asking. Like it is a great feeling, right? When it's like two things combine, you're like, I'm doing the right thing. Like uh, the universe is telling you the thing you're doing is making you happy and people are like appreciating you for it. Yeah, it definitely, it definitely is a beautiful thing as, as long as you have that balance, I guess. So you're not doing it because of that need for external validation. Mm-hmm. You're doing it because you love it, which like raises an interesting question about poker, actually. So I want to put this to you. I don't know if you ever thought about this before. So if someone said to you, do you want to come and play soccer right now? And you had the time mm-hmm. and it wasn't an inconvenience, you'd probably be like, yeah, come on, let's go kick about, right? Yep. But if someone said to you, Hey, do you want to play poker? Like no money, but let's just go play and have a game. Hmm. It doesn't have that same feel, right? Have you ever thought about that in any? Yeah, I, I don't. I think, well, it's weird because like poker is in between a passion and a job for me. Like when I first started playing 100% passion, I mean, I quit a really lucrative job for poker. So I did feel like this is a calling. I want to do this. Um, and then as time went on, it's not, it's not as much of a passion. I'm exploring other things in poker that I enjoy. Um, that is more of like a creative feeling, you know, poker doesn't have that for me, but when I think about a job and how I felt as as a lawyer, and then I think about like something I'm passionate about, um, like sports and other things like joke writing and all this stuff, 
poker's in the middle. And I feel like that's an okay compromise. I think for mm. most people, that's that would be really good in their lives if they could make money doing something that they're not miserable doing. You know, it's not the biggest passion in my life, but it's also, I mean, compared to a real job, I feel like it's still great. So when you were younger, you you play, you're really passionate about sports. Was mm-hmm. there, was what was your thinking, you know, as we're growing up and we're, we're teenagers and we're thinking towards like, you know, this pull to be a woman, this pull to be, you know, a grown up and to, mm-hmm. and to do something and to choose something. What were you, I know so, it's a, it's a I'm wild black. I'm going to say you're old, but what were your thoughts? What were your thoughts around then, around that tug of war of moving from being a girl to being a woman, and having to make these choices? And how did uh, soccer fit into that? Mm-hmm. Um, I I delayed turning a grown up for so long. I just think even when I was 16 or 17, um, I graduated high school in 17 and got into some really really good schools and turned them down to be a walk on at Rutgers. So I didn't even know I was going to make the team, but I wanted to play soccer there. Those were growing up, I used to get their autographs at games. I thought they were celebrities. Um and that's all I wanted to do. So I turned down scholarships at other schools um for what turned out to be a 1 in 6 chance they ended up picking 6 out of 30 of us. Um I was so sure I was going to make it. I was just like completely sure of myself and it was crazy because I don't think looking back now I'm like there are a lot of good players at that tryout um and that was all that mattered to me I didn't care about like what what my vocation was going to be I wasn't like oh Rutgers has a good program in x I'm going to do that nope it was all about soccer never about boys I was like probably the most frustrating girl to like in high school because I'm like yeah I'll go to prom with you not going to kiss you or care about you (laughs) like I cared about I wanted to get straight A's and I wanted to play soccer um and that was just it like I I had a lot of friends but I wasn't really it wasn't like oh I'm a woman and I'm gonna you know nothing like that it wasn't until college that I started caring about dating and stuff um Mm. and so I don't know everything sports were like my 100% focus when I was young and yes there wasn't a whole lot of consideration for where I was going to go with my life I just kind of went with the flow what are you what are you most proud of when you think about your um early years playing soccer Um, just being a hundred percent into something. I think that's so hard to find. Um, I was, you know, I, I would become the best player on a team and then I'd find a better team. And that was like over and over again. And my mom, my mom and dad, we had four kids in my family. So the fact that they, and and not a lot of money at all, they were both just school teachers. Um, the fact that they went along with that, they saw how important it was to me and would take me to a team an hour away where you have practice twice a week. Um, Mm. to make sure that I'm not the best player on the team. Like I want to have room for growth. Um, that was really awesome. And I like still appreciate that now in adulthood, because even though I'm not a professional athlete, I just kick around for fun. Like I'll play when we play in the summer with like the Vegas world cup, whatever. Um, it it doesn't matter. I feel like this stuff, the, the feelings that instills in you when you were able to pursue something a hundred percent, even if you don't get there, even if you're like genetically not going to be, I'm not five ten huge, like beastly woman that could play on the national team or something, but just being able to pursue something and feel that feeling of like, I gave it a hundred percent and I got support from my family and got to see how far I could go. And I got pretty far. We made the sweet 16 when I was at Rutgers. It was a pretty, it was a pretty cool experience. Um, and then, having that feeling, you start to look for it later in life too. And I feel like that helped me leave law to, to be in poker because I was like, I want to feel what it feels like to care about what I'm doing, not just Mm. make money to like, not, not just trade hours of your life for money pretty much. Yeah. Yeah. The old uh, money or your life. Great book by, um, Vicky Robin, if anybody's interested in that book. Um, so when did, uh, when did your passion for soccer, um, wane or change direction so we're 100% soccer all I want to do is soccer I'm not interested in going <laughs> to the ball not interested mm-hmm. in Prince Charming soccer 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 when did that change um I actually cried over it this is so funny I was such a kid uh, I was it was my sophomore year of college and I had started getting more playing time at Rutgers but I did the thing that I always did was I found the best team I could make and then I'm a scrub on that team it, it, there's room for growth but I mean the writing's on the wall I'm five five uh, I wasn't the biggest, strongest, and and that team was just so good. So I only got some playing time there. I didn't feel like I was moving up. Um, I didn't. I felt like I maxed out everything that I could do to try to be a better player. Um, mm-hmm. And I had been running track at the same time and getting so much better so fast at that because that really is like put in the work, the effort, run seventy miles a week, get better. It's just like one for one. There's no. 
you know, you're going to, in soccer, it's like, maybe you have some epiphany and get really good at some point, but you could also just be like maxed out. I felt like that. Like, There's better players on my team. I'm not going to be a starter. Um, and then for track, I just started getting better. And my coach actually said, um, if you quit soccer and join the cross country team, instead, the seasons overlapped, um, you'll be a scholarship athlete. Like you'll be the second best runner on the team and we need you. And it was like, I had a horrible like two or three days of just like weighing it all over and just thinking, uh, how am I going to feel about this? But really being on a team and being like really important to the team and also just feeling like every minute I put into working uh, at this one sport, I was getting some return on that investment. I quit and it was like uh, having to call my mom and dad and tell them, oh yeah, you drove me all over God's creation for my whole childhood, but now I'm going to play a sport you guys have no interest in. (laughs) because <laughs> there's yeah. there's nothing like for a, a parent especially if they love the game to be standing on the sidelines cheering on their child but there's nothing as more ex- excruciating and annoying than turning up on your kids on the bench yeah and that was <laughs> college know? for me I, I just yeah. I, I can't even tell you like I have never tried harder at anything in my life I probably never will again I would I would try until I was injured um mm. and it just was it's a thing where I'm like I respect the people that I'm, I'm going for the spots, uh, the starting spots of women that were really good. And I respect their work ethic too. It wasn't a thing where I'm like, I'm going to outwork this girl and take her spots. Like she started out probably better than me and works as hard as me. So where am I ever going to find like a spot in here? Um, and then with track, it was great though. Cause it was like, I, I went from barely making the team freshman year to being the second best runner on, on a team of 15, the girl who was better than me ended up going to the Olympics and I like, she was my training partner. It was just wow. a really cool, like just switching to that and just feeling like, I don't know. I, it was like, it was just a cool thing to be able to pivot from something I thought I'd do my whole entire life into something else that I also enjoyed. And I still do. I ran like six marathons after I graduated. I, I think it's a really good sport for like meditation and, and mm-hmm. mind clearing and stuff. And I still use it in poker as like a, a break from all the craziness to just go for a run. I am um, I'm in a coaching container at the moment called the leap and every time I'm I'm running I'm listening to coaching assignments or I'm leaving messages with people and and all my uh peers keep sending me Lee just run yeah you're, you're losing leave the your experience yeah, yeah you're losing the experience of running yeah I swear leave your phone at home I I mean we're all connected to our phones at all times now hmm. but in college I never it would be like I leave my phone and my keys and my whatever I'd have like my one room key and that's it. And I would go and you go. run for two hours. And it's just how like no one does that anymore. Just like you're just have a quiet mind for two hours. I don't know. I probably couldn't do it now. I like 20 minutes away. I'm like, well, I got to check Twitter. <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, I, I'm a little bit like that. I, I feel like I'm not being as productive, but I'm, I'm going to listen to people. I think, I think, you know, once you, once you find someone who makes a bit of sense, listening mm-hmm. to them is really important. The same container that I'm in the coaching assignment this week was, all about um, breaking up with your parents and learning and understanding where we have uh, masculine and feminine wounds as a result of where our parents were, you know, just not capable of showing up in the way we needed because of life and their own rule book and having four kids and all that kind of stuff. Um, you said that your parents were really great um, driving you around and all that kind of thing. Where do you think that you um, you look back in hindsight now as a youngster, where do you think you 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 missed out where do you think that uh, somehow they missed the mark because of whatever rule book they had or pressures that they had in life um they didn't really realize that my older brother and sister were so mean <laughs> i think that right. was the thing. i'm fine with them now like we get along now but my, my little brother and i had like a real friendship um and my older brother and older sister i still have like wounds from that where it's like you mm. were the younger one that they didn't want around like that feels really bad. And I don't think my parents realized that because they would just see my brother and sister like grudgingly including me like, oh, they're including you. Like, I'm like, yeah, but I would get beat up. Like I'm mm. playing with big kids and they took no mercy on me. And I feel like they never really wanted me around. It was just like, if we need an- another person, that kind of thing. Like I used to love going to school. I'd go to school and I was sick. I'd pretend to not be sick because I loved the people I went to school with and like the kids my own age. But yeah, growing up, like the bullying only came from my older siblings. It's so weird. And then it's it's extra weird because I'm like, if I ever had issues with other people, they'd be on my side. <laughs> like if there was right. a in the neighborhood who was a real asshole, they're on my side about it. But when I'm at home, I'm getting beat up. 
<laughs> like never get to right. play Nintendo with them or anything. Um, but that's it. And that kind of like, it's so weird because it's every, everyone gets screwed up somehow in childhood. There's no way yeah. to like escape it unscathed. But as I'm like getting older, I'll be, I don't really trust people when they're like, oh, we really want you around. Like, yeah, come join our group. We're going to be playing this game. I'm just like, are you sure? Are you just being nice? Like, are you forced right. to do this? And it like took a really long time to be like, God, this is from that experience growing up of just like not feeling worthy or whatever. But it was not really, it wasn't my parents. Like, I feel like for having not a lot of money at all and having both full-time teaching jobs, um, they really did as much as they possibly could to like make sure we all got to pursue our interests and turned out okay. <laughs> so no complaints from them. It's really interesting you said that because obviously I, I interview a lot of poker players and there seems to be a theme that in, in general, poker players are really kind of positive about the the impact that their parents had on their growing up. It's, it's unusual to have, um, you know, like a Jason Coon story, for example, where his dad abused him physically. It's unusual to have that. Generally, it's like a really good luck story. And I, I wonder if there's a relationship in terms of how people are raised and brought up by their parents and that entry into poker or how it serves them into being a professional poker player? I, I could see it being a matter of confidence. Like when you mm. have a support system at home and you feel like your parents will love you even if you screw up, it's easy to veer off the path a little bit. If mm. you don't have that feeling, you've had a bad childhood and you feel like you, I don't know, it feels like you do the safe thing maybe more because it's just, you can't handle any more negative feedback or I, I don't know. I, like that is interesting, but I mean, Kuhn crushes the whole entire world and he like, uses his hours every day so wisely and stuff so I don't know like I don't know how he escaped that and became who he is but he's definitely like he's one of the people when they're like oh yeah we don't have any good ambassadors in poker I'm like are you kidding me like (laughs) (laughs) this dude crushes life I think Jason is a good example of you know if we, we look at how our parents impacted us and if we can say to ourselves you know I have all my needs met and I think like I show up and do a really good job then there's some there's something about the way we were raised by whoever raised us that, you know, that was really fantastic or we used the bad elements to our advantage that we wouldn't have been able to have done if they weren't there. So I guess out of any adversity comes some gold, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. So and he's just a good example. I, like I, not like people who, there are a lot of people who've had like very traumatic childhoods and mm-hmm. there might be too much to overcome. So it's not like a judgment of those people, but I think mm-hmm. he's such a success story of, getting out of any kind of victim mentality and just getting over it and crushing every single challenge after that. And, and then, you know, you go to therapy and deal with the stuff, but like, I know there's a lot of people that would have his kind of childhood and just be like, well, this is my excuse forever to just not, not be good at things and not try hard. It's like, Oh, it's not my fault or whatever. I feel like, I don't know. It's amazing that he got out of his situation and is now like an elite poker player in one of the poker is a tough climate to be elite in for so many years too. It just Mm. gets harder and harder, but. Yeah. And bloody and nice. Yeah. <laughs> that not, not 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 social media nice. Yeah. So like what I find <laughs> what I find in poker is this like, oh wow, this guy's look at this guy, he's really nice. Like he he donates millions and millions of people money to charity, and then you meet him, he's like a fucking complete dick. Like J- Jason, when you meet him, like social media, he's nice, and you meet him, oh he really is yeah. nice. <laughs> <laughs> he's really kind and respect. I like that about the guy. Mm-hmm. Um, anyway, away from Jason, he's had his he has had his moments of light limelight with me. <laughs> Um, he's not the hero today. Um, so when you were growing up, your older siblings give you a bit of a hard time. What, what, any other challenges you had as a, as a youngster that um, you look back on now and you're like, oh man, that was so difficult to get through? Um, I feel like I was pretty lucky that bullying from my siblings and, and wanting to not be at home and to be at school more, that's, that's about it. And then I was really small. I was like the latest of late bloomers. Like I think I was under five feet tall when I graduated from high school. Um, so wanting to crush at sports, but also being this little shrimp um, was not that easy. I was knocked around on the field as well, but also like, that's pretty cool that my siblings prepared me for that, for just being like, all right, I'm this tiny little human compared to my, my competitors um, and was still able to make division one soccer. Like that was good. But but really, like, it's hard to say what my challenges were because I was so singularly focused on sports. And I'm just like, whatever, I'm sure. Like, this one girl in middle school used to bully me about my clothes being really cheap and, and that I had all hand-me-downs that were out of style. But I couldn't, I was like, oh, that girl's an asshole. <laughs> but that could have, like, crushed me if I was, like, really 
caring about fitting in and being popular mm. or like looking cool but i was just like whatever she plays soccer and she sucks and like i beat her at that so she's like that's right. <laughs> that's the lens i viewed everything through it's just like this is what's important and like nothing else is really important so soccer in a way gave you your confidence your status hierarchy if you like it's like if i'm good on the field that's mm-hmm. that's that's good enough for me it so. gives you so many friends too and i feel like even nowadays like even in poker um people really value like on a team obviously they're going to value if you're a good soccer player there's like oh lee scores all the goals for us we like mm-hmm. him it's kind of like that and then in poker it's it's so weird but it's like that too where if you're in a group of friends and you can help them study you get better or in some way like help them socially or something it still is like that kind of where it's mm-hmm. like if you can offer something to the group then you're cool and you have friends yeah. I don't know. I don't know if it's very fair, but I feel like that's pretty true. Mm, I like that uh, mentality. So as you're going through school, um, you get into law. Is, was law your first job that you found or did you have another job going? going yeah, I had a lot of little jobs like in high school and, and college and stuff. I waitressed a lot and everything like that. But law was my first real job. Um, and even going to law school was like I still wasn't a grown up and I just my priorities were all kind of screwed up. But uh, I didn't really study for the LSAT. I spent a week studying for it where like some people spend three months studying for it and they pay for classes and stuff. I was taking it as like, let's see how I do. If, if I do well, it means I should go to law school. And if I don't do well, I double majored in English and psychology. I was like, I might just go get a master's in psychology or maybe I'll be a teacher. I didn't really care that much. It didn't seem like I always thought I'd have a lot of different jobs. So it didn't seem that important at that point in my life. Um, I ended up getting a good score and I ended up getting into uh, University of Michigan, which was like ranked, it was like seventh in the country or something. So like pretty good school. Um, and they early decision allowed me in. So I was like, oh, cool. I, within the matter of two months, I decided to take the LSAT, took the LSAT, applied for the school, got into the school. I was like, all right, I've never been to Michigan. Seems cool though. They have a good football team. Let's check it out. Uh, I commit to going there. And that is how I made my decisions. It's insane it's 150k of student loans <laughs> it's three years of my life it's freaking freezing there what was I thinking I just like I don't know I like I really think I used to just do everything on a whim just uh this sounds fun I'm gonna go do it and like getting a job didn't seem fun going for more school seemed fun so that's what I chose how far was Michigan from where you lived um it was like a nine and a half hour drive wow so you was gonna be alone as well yep So yeah, that was, that was hard. I didn't even think about it. I just thought like, this is an adventure. It's going to be fun. I pack up my whole car and I'm like, as I'm driving there by myself, I was like, oh yeah, this is a big deal. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Like, I don't know a single person in this entire state. Um, I also, I was in a two year relationship in college and we were like, I guess we'll be long distance, but it was weird. I'm like, who's going to go long distance for three years? Like he was like, I don't know. So we ended up, um, we ended up breaking up like pretty fast when I was there because he visited me like twice and I was like this is so hard like we can't do this anymore so we broke up and that was like that was so hard to just be like meeting all new friends and all new people and kind of losing my like biggest lifeline at home um and then my dad passed away suddenly and like that was that was definitely the hardest um like three month period of my life that I have ever had and I hope will ever have because I had kind of an identity crisis where I'm in school with people I don't know. I don't play sports anymore. Um, Broke up with my boyfriend. I'm with all these smart people. So I don't even feel smart. I was just like, oh, I'm just one of these people at the school. Like all the stuff that I thought made me special. I'm now just like in a crowd of people. Um, And then my dad passed away and he, I was like, I was born on his birthday. I was a major daddy's girl. I was every sport he was interested. I played every like, and everything I did growing up, I was just, I was always trying to like be more like him. Um, and that just, that like shook everything. And I just, I don't know, it was so weird coming back from that a week after his funeral, my mom, um, convinced me to go back to school, which I didn't want to do at all. Um, Mm -hmm. I just said, I don't, I'm like, my priorities are so screwed up. I'm so like crazy right now in my head. I've never had so many things change at once. I don't want to go. And she like made me go. Cause she just said, I don't want this to be like the defining thing in your life. Um, and I went back to school and I was just like a horrible student for two months till the semester ended. I couldn't give a shit. It, and it's so funny. It's all this stuff. Law school is so competitive. Everyone, they graded on a curve and there might be one A in the class of a hundred people. Um, everyone was trying to get the A. Everyone wanted to be like a Supreme Court justice or something fancy. 
And I used to be like that. And then after my dad passed away, I was like, this is so stupid. <laughs> like, how can you really care that much? How can you be so cutthroat with all these people? Like, and I ended up like being a really relaxed law student two years, the next two years, I just made friends. I played, I went back, I played all these intramural sports and like, I got into marathon running. I just was doing everything else um, and not, and I wasn't accomplishment driven anymore. And that kind of never came back. Like, I don't have that. Like, I don't know if it was because of my dad. He was like super proud of all my accomplishments growing up. I don't know if I was doing that stuff for him or what, or if it was just a big shift after seeing like how your life can get, like how your life can just end in a blink, how your family is all screwed up. And like, I don't know, it just seems like the things I was chasing before that were just not quite as important after it all settled. Thanks for sharing that, Jamie, because I know these things are not easy to talk about. The, um, the loss of competitiveness, it reminds me of when I was a kid, when I was like, you know, winning player of the year playing soccer like every year. But I was an angry little fucker and I was, an, I was <laughs> not a very nice leader. Like, so, so like I would drag our team through to success but man, I would hurt so many people along the way, right? Um, and then when when people would say, the people who knew soccer were like, just leave him alone. The mm-hmm. ones who didn't were like, Lee, you need to like calm down. And then I, for me, as I started to calm down, I lost something, right? So I think that's what you're talking about, like this, this, uh, this, uh, this, this spark to just get you up an extra notch. So I'm curious how if you lost that, that sparkle, if you like mm-hmm. that, and, and we, you know, it, it could have been around your, your, your father's death or, 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 or whatever it was. How did you then, how did you become a lawyer? How did you become a mm-hmm. professional poker player? Did, like it, it didn't die. Did it die forever or did you find something else? What happened? No, no it was just weird. It, it was like, I just was driven to do things like soccer was a passion, but then school wasn't. I just was trying to get A's because that's the best you could do. So I would just be a nerd. I like I would skimp on sleep or whatever, just to make sure I got A's. Um, And then in law school, that was going to be very hard to do. Like there were people there that were just brilliant um, and that were also very hardworking. So I wasn't going to get the A in classes. There was nothing like I could have studied all the time. Maybe I'd get one of the A's. You're not getting five A's in a semester. No one is. So having that crazy drive to try to do that was always going to end in disaster. If I continued, I would just be very upset with myself or like feel like a failure um, from not being able to achieve that. And like that, it's weird because it's like I it was a loss of tunnel visioning. Right. Like after my dad died, I'm like getting perspective is like you've zoomed out instead of zooming in and being like need to get the A, need to study and all this stuff. Um, And I feel like that look, there's good and bad about it, right? Like Mm. I was more social. I had more friends. I did more activities. I started playing sports again. I'm not going to get A's in class. Oh, well, like there's a give and take there. And and I still graduated. I was never going to not graduate. That's what's like the worst case scenario in my mind when I was an overachiever was like, oh my God, I might not reach the highest level. And then after that, I was like, okay, the middle level of graduating University of Michigan is that you get a good job. (laughs) <laughs> you get bees and they give you a good job. It was just a thing where like, I'm like, you don't have to be this crazy overachiever. Some of those people crushed life though. Like I have friends that were brilliant and hardworking and got to the highest level in law. You know, they're in some appeals court as a judge right now. And I think like, that's great for them. Um, they actually just like kept with it and that's what they wanted from their life. That was their soccer for them. Yeah. Um, and I don't know. I think zooming out was really good for me. Like clearly I would rather still be a psychotic overachiever with a living dad. Um, but to be able to like take, get some perspective in that moment and stop beating myself up for things that are just, I don't know, if you work really hard, how can you be upset with yourself? Like it's just so stupid. Mm, it's almost like, uh, expectations kind of lowered, which allowed, um, you know, a greater mix of beautiful, different emotions. Cause we talk about the Supreme court judge, you know, we like, oh yeah, they got there, but we don't really know what it's like now they're there. So like going back to Kuhn again, Kuhn was, he wanted to achieve and achieve and overachieve. And now he's there, you know, if you speak to him, it's kind of like, okay, I'm not going to be here forever. Cause it's, cause once you're there, it's not, it doesn't feel like you thought mm-hmm. it would. Right. Whereas you had enough about you to get into the poker industry and make it, make a living as a professional poker player. Um, but then you, the, 
lack of overachieving means that, means that you don't play 25Ks every week for a living, right? Right. And that's like in poker, there's always a chance to move up. So I think that appeals to me still. It's not like if you're in a law firm and you make partner, you make a lot of money, but you really, that's it. You kind of just like, you're a rich person who <laughs> is important in your job, but there's not a whole lot of room for you in poker. Mm. I'm like, there's so many levels of making it in poker where mm. you can be making it if you just avoid your job. Like some people might play one, two and two, five, and they avoid a job they hated and they're just happier around their family. And they like enjoy waking up in the morning. That's success. Mm. And you know, maybe some people won't count themselves as successful until they take down a hundred K high roller. And then to them, that's success. Like for me, I've, I've changed. I've kind of like moved the goalposts so many times, like one year, maybe I feel successful because I'm a live cash grinder and have made X amount of money. And then in another year I feel successful because I got to do cool commentary jobs I like, and that's where my income came from. And I just think like, that's, what's kept me interested in it is that I get to make choices along the way and um, I get to experience some successes and failures along the way. And not every year is exactly the same. Mm -hmm. Um, that, that kind of makes me still be interested in it. And I still have this spark of like, maybe I'll just become a hermit for a year and just study and become just a poker player again. Mm -hmm. Like just try to crush and like use solvers. And I have so many people, I have such access to so many good players that I do spend some time sometimes where I'm like, I'm going to go hard at this. And I don't know. It's like that choice is always there too. I feel like it's just a cool game to get involved in because it's just ever changing. And there's so many different ways to make money. (laughs) It's funny how life changes. And when I left the railway to be a professional poker player, I would have given my right arm to be surrounded by the people who are on my phone right now. And yep. now I am. <laughs> now I could literally just reach out to them and say, do me a favor. Do you want to help me play, teach, teach me how to play poker? They'd be like, yeah, sure. Uh, and now it's just like, well, I don't really want to do that right now because my, my life and my direction has changed. It's really yeah. interesting. It's insane too, because it's like you kind of, I moved past that point of feeling like all these people are celebrities just a little too soon, because it would have blown my mind to just like, actually, Lon and Norm commentating with them, I was like, that still felt like, I was like, whoa, this is so cool. But other people that I've met along the way, I'm like, oh my God, if I had met you in like 2010, I would have been like, picture, photograph, like I need a signature and all this stuff. Um, And then, I don't know, it's like, as you get more entrenched in poker the shine kind of wears off a lot of poker players because you're like okay like I'm also navigating my way through this and they don't seem as like shiny and new and like as celebrities um and it's it kind of sucks because I'm like I think if I still had I'm looking at some of the younger people coming up like Landon Tice is gonna crush the world this dude is like already winning live tournaments the first time he plays them um he has that still because he's new and he's just like, mm. wow, I'm on Joey Ingram's podcast. He's like, oh, cool. Like you and Marley had me on your, like, he still thinks it's all so cool. And I'm like, I kind of wish I had moved up in poker a little bit faster because then mm. I would have had those moments of like surreal feelings of just like meeting some of these people. I, I remember mine. I had plenty of them, but one of them was being in Shiphall Airport with Remco and Frank Optowood and Marcel Lusk. But he, but he wasn't in his suit. He, he was in a, a, a like a, a shell suit, like a track suit. Mm-hmm. Um, and I remember f- thinking, and I said to him, like, no, Marcel, like, what are you doing on this plane with us? Like, <laughs> it, it, haven't you got your own plane? And he just looked at me and he said, dude, we're all broke. <laughs> I just, I just remember it. Like you say, like, we're all totally broke. And my but, image of him in this suit with the classy on the TV, thinking this guy's a multi gazillionaire and he's there in his so white funny. shell suit in, in um, economy and, you know, on, on uh, KLM. Like I love so, people so like funny. that, though. They don't take themselves too seriously. They don't need to maintain uh, maintain some stupid image. Like, I think those people are the best. Like, I, all right, say what you will about Madiso. There's a lot to say about Madiso, but I like these just like, okay, my bankroll is 20K. I put 10K on this Daniel Negreanu match. And I'm like, oh no. But it, <laughs> if it was 10 years ago, he'd be like, I have oh, millions of dollars and I have a Lamborghini and blah, blah, you know? And that kind of, I feel like a lot of poker players have shed that false facade and they are now actually just being like, listen, like if you ask someone, hey, should I play poker for a living? They're going to give you an honest answer. 10 years ago, they'd be like, oh, I'm rich and there's women hanging all over me and I have 10 cars. And I feel like that kind of went away. And I appreciate that a lot about people now. Yeah, you you either get um, raw honesty or I'm not going to do an interview. (laughs) You know, like, (laughs) you know, it's it's the the kind of like that flamboyance is uh, you don't really like I think the. 
the rise of podcasting mm. and getting people more into long form conversations means there's there's um, not a lot of room for that bullshit, especially if you've got a decent person asking the questions and poking around. It's, you know, you're either going to avoid <laughs> doing them or you're going to turn up and you're going to tell the truth, right? Which is, yeah, I've got a lot of money or no, I ain't got a lot of money, you mm. know? And one thing we do learn through poker is, you know, money is fuel for the game and what you want to do, but it doesn't necessarily mean you're going to have a great, wonderful, beautiful life, right? Right. It only matters if you have very little or very much. <laughs> and then other than that, people in poker, like I feel like some people who are just staying afloat are pretty happy with their lives. And some, you know, some people aren't building wealth in poker. They're just enjoying themselves for a few years and then they're going to go invest in a company or do something else. Yeah. So like yeah. that's, that's changed a lot too. I used to feel like if you weren't just playing poker, you weren't a professional poker player. Like if someone said, oh, I'm a professional poker player. I also do podcasting. I also blog. I'd be like, oh, I guess they're not that good at poker. I don't think it's like that anymore. I feel like now a lot of people have diversified just because it's good for their lives. Mm. Um, that you can be a professional poker player when 70% of your income comes from poker. I still count that when my friends are like, oh, I also do crypto. I also do whatever. I'm like, I think that that's just a sign of a healthy person <laughs> that you've branched out and that you're not counting on surviving the variance of especially tournament poker for from year to year. Well, do you think there's a status issue there as well? So like, um, you know, on one hand, you've got someone going, you know, I'm, a, an ap- I'm absolutely crushing it in poker and all I do is poker. And then you've got someone else going, well, yeah, I make a bit of money through poker and then I make a bit of money through writing and I make a bit of money through. Do you think there's a status thing there? It's like, why, why aren't I crushing it? Yeah, poker? for sure there is, but it's so silly because our, for one thing, that used to come up a lot though. And I would get, I still get messages from that, like, how do I know what I should turn pro? And, and, you know, if you're not jumping off completely from a job, that's a hundred percent of your time and your pay, then just do it slowly. Like if you're someone who does a bunch of other things for money, like, why do you need to go on this day? I will no longer make money doing anything else. I'm only going to play poker. That used to be a question I got a lot. And now I'm like, I think that that isn't good for a lot of people. Um, the swings are mentally very hard. So I, I don't know. I respect people who have their, hand in a lot of different things um a lot of those people probably could just play poker like it would just mean that the time that you use using to do something creative and branching out you're now sitting in your office studying if that's something you want to do then be just a poker player but I think I'm kind of proud of doing other things and then when I'm having a mental breakdown from poker which like will come if you're a tournament player (laughs) you're gonna have (laughs) bad days and months um if you're feeling like that you at least have somewhere to like detour for a little while um, and like creatively focus on something else. And you don't have to watch your, your bankroll dwindle while you're taking a break. I think that's really good for people. And I think that that might actually increase a lot of people's longevity in the game. If it's not all their eggs in one basket all the time. It's that time where we remind you that if it was not for the support of Run It Once Poker, I would not be able to share virtual COVID spit with the likes of Jamie Kerstetter. So it's time to give them a little shout out. Real Poker is an online poker room for players created by players. And if that appeals to you, then head to once.run forward slash hero play today and you can pick up a 100% welcome bonus up to a ceiling of $600. And there are two elements to this deposit bonus that make it blood brilliant. First, it never expires as long as you play one hand every 30 days. And second, all of your deposits during your first 30 days count towards a bonus. So remember that URL folks, once.run forward slash hero play. If you want to be the best, ba-bing, then you need to learn from the best and you don't get a better place to meet the best than Run It Once is training site. A lot of alliteration of the letter B there, wasn't it? Sign up today and you will receive two new training videos daily and three elite videos, including one from the Mandalorian himself, Mr. Philip Galfond. And the link you're looking for for Run It Once training is once.run forward slash hero learn. So when you were being going into law and you became a lawyer, what did that look like? You was you like uh, protecting people like Jeffrey Dahmer? Like what, what was your what was your job? It was worse than that. I was a tax attorney. A tax attorney. <laughs> Boo! Boo! And really, I, I worked at a big law firm and uh, had wealthy clients. So I was just helping wealthy clients save money on their taxes. It was 
so unfulfilling. The reason I went to the tax department too is because they were paying for me to get my master's in taxation. It was the only department that I could go for more school. And at the time, that's all I wanted to do was study more and I just enjoyed it. So that's why I picked that. But then when I was actually a tax attorney, I'm like, God, this is so boring. I was doing estate planning for rich people. Um, and yeah, <laughs> the people I worked with were cool. They were really smart. I respected them. But how can I spend like, I don't know, how do you spend 30 years of your life doing that? Like, and feel good about it. That, that's why when people are like, oh, you're a poker player. Like, how do you feel about that? You're not saving the world. I was like, uh, the thing I was doing before was worse. <laughs> mm. How did that come to realization though? So for me on the railway, I did 20 years and it was almost like um, virgin on a, I think a, a virgin on a mental breakdown. Like, you know, when, when you're crying because you have to go into work, it's a sign that you need to get the fuck out of there, right? <laughs> like, how did, how did this, holy shit, I can't be doing this for 30 years. How, how did it manifest in you emotionally, physically? What was the breaking point? How did that all work out? So what's so crazy is that I didn't leave my first firm. They they laid off everybody I started with after it was about a year and a half in. Um, a lot of banks were their clients and it was during the banking crisis. So they were losing clients and they mm. did not have a lot of money. They weren't doing well. So they just it was like uh, last in, first out. So all the new mm. people just got the showers. Um, and it was so crazy because I had no idea what I was going to do. Like I went and I stayed with my best friend from law school. I'm like, Hey, can I come to your couch in Chicago? And he's like, okay, sure. I stayed on his couch. I helped him online date. That was like my month after. That was your job. That was your, I, I used that to was your edit job. All his, yeah. I used to edit all his messages to add jokes to them and stuff. Um, that's all I did. And then I had been playing poker at the time, um, quite a bit actually. Like that's the only thing I really did for fun. I would drive down Atlantic city after working till 7 PM play five ten for two hours, try to make 500 bucks, whatever my, whatever I thought was possible. And then I would drive back, go to sleep, go to work. I would do that multiple times a week. That's how much I loved poker. Um, so when I was laid off, I'm like, okay, Borgata winter open is starting. And I, after Chicago, I just went and played it. I didn't even know about tournaments or anything. I met some friends. We played some sit and goes. I made a little bit of money and I'm like, all right, I'm going to do this and send out a bunch of resumes and get another job. Um, the market was absolutely terrible. Like I had friends from, uh, who did better than me in school getting laid off from, from better law firms. Uh, and I'm like, all right, I'll just play poker until things change. And I did that for two years, got a new job. The first time I applied for a job, I got it. I had so much regret instantly. Cause I was like, Oh, this seems like a good job. Maybe I'll apply. I'll hear about it in a month or two. Maybe I'll get an interview. It was like the next day interview, the next day hired. I'm like, ah, oh, shit. Right. <laughs> like, I my, freedom, my freedom is gone. Yeah, I wasn't actually ready to leave poker. I just wanted to like chill out my family who were worried about me and just I wanted to like test the waters and see what the job market was like. And then I just snap got hired. I like got along with people so well. I'm like, oh, <laughs> so I did that for another year. And every day after the first few months, I was like, I don't like this. I, I really thought about it for probably like three or four months straight every day. I thought I might quit when I go in today. What didn't you like? What didn't you like? What was it? What had changed? It just wasn't something I was interested in at all. I like, mm. I never was though. I went to law school because I got a good score on a test. Like I wasn't into it. Even in law school, I was just like, okay, I'm going to study hard and try to get a good grade. I was never like, if I had had a passion, like now I would be a much better law student and a much better lawyer because there's things I actually care about where right? I'd probably want to work for the ACLU or I'd want to do something where I'm like, I'm going to make a difference. There's going to be something that inspires me to work. That isn't mm. money. Mm. Um, being a lawyer, there wasn't anything. I'm like, I feel good when I do a good job. Like I would do some tax research and I would send it to the partner and they'd be like, this is really good. And I'd be like, I feel good. That was it though. There was no like, oh, and I helped this client who's needy or, uh, you know, I improved this person's life who like really, really needed help. There was none of that. So I just went into the wrong part of law. Mm. Um, and so one day I just quit. I, I finally went through with it and I felt crazy. Like I, I remember talking to the partner. I was just like, I like asked her if it was okay. I was just like, Hey, can I just wrap up all these plans and be done with this? And she was like, what do you mean? I was like, yeah, we had a good discussion. I just said, I don't mm. think this is my life. Like, this isn't what I want to be doing. Um, and, you know, it's the kind of thing where if I had a family already, um, there, were, there are things I understand why the people who don't leave don't leave. Like some of them have huge responsibilities where they need to make a lot of money. Some of them enjoy the work. They like feel good when they're in court arguing a thing that I wouldn't feel good about. So I just went to the wrong thing. And mm. 
like poker was just an off ramp and I didn't know if poker was going to be my thing for this long. But at the time I was just like, okay, I see that there's another path. I know a lot of people who are doing this weird job. They're, they're fine. Their lives are okay. And like, I can go do this, I can live out of a suitcase if I want to. And that was just a really cool thing. But I picked the week before black Friday to quit, which was. Wow. Great. <laughs> Good timing. Yeah. So, but it, so it wasn't, it wasn't the passion of poker that dragged you towards it. It was almost like the, um, the despair of having to turn up every day for law and then thinking <laughs> I can't do this anything else is is better and poker's better yeah it's like being in a bad relationship that's like okay you're like maintaining the status quo every day and poker was just like uh, dating you're like mm. oh wait there are people out here that could be better like it's there it was somewhat of an impetus to quit but it wasn't mm. the only thing like if I was happy in my law job I would have stayed but it was the combination of looking down the road 30 years and thinking how sad I'll be if this is how I chose to spend my life when I feel like I had potential to do other things. Um, and that shiny other thing, you know, where I'm like, if you're going to work a 10 or 12 hour day, drive two hours to Atlantic city to play two hours of a game, drive two hours back. Like that is a real passion. That's not mm -hmm. something that like a lot of people would want to do. And I was getting better very quickly and I was winning money online. So I just said, all right, at least even if this isn't the thing I want to do for, for 30 years, it's going to be something where I can explore it for a while, get some traveling in, meet some cool people and at least like have a good experience. So you said that you would work and then you would go to Atlantic city and play five ten. I was expecting you to say I would work and I would go out Atlantic city and play one, one. <laughs> so why, why was you playing fight 10? Like there must be a story that leads up to fight 10 or was you just rich and fight 10 as you're in? No, I played a ton in law school and I was good. Like that back mm. in the day, reading people was a thing. Being good at math was a thing. And it was like, if you're willing to make changes to your game, it wasn't, you have to study solvers. You have to talk to Scott Seaver and get his advice. It wasn't like that. It's like, if you have friends who are pretty smart and pretty good at the game, you can talk hand histories and get better. If you're willing to admit your mistakes and realize like, oh, that's not a good starting hand. There wasn't, like I would go on two plus two and I would share hands um, on high stakes MTTs and mid stakes MTTs and stuff like that and get good advice. But I feel like you could be good by just being pretty smart and being honest with yourself and like tweaking your game. And I was beating 510, I was, I was beating two five in law school um, mm -hmm. and then 510 after law school. Um, but obviously- the game was it was a joke like I wasn't like some amazing crusher I just was trying slightly harder than other people and, and it was enough to, to beat that game going back to that time period um what is it about how you educated yourself or taught yourself the game that still exists today and you would give advice to people today and what parts of what how you learned are just completely obsolete today <laughs> books i feel so bad for people who still write poker books like there are <laughs> I, i'll still read a couple like um andrew brokus has a good book um the ones that are still very heavily math based um there's still some nuggets in there um but really it's just such a stagnant way to learn and the game changes all the time so how can that like you could write a book it's amazing for a year and mm -hmm. then it's done mm -hmm. um i think the things that have stuck around uh having a good poker community, having people you trust for feedback, that will never get old. Like even if the person isn't gonna go through your hands with the fine tooth comb, they might just go, oh, well, that's kind of a weird turn back. And then you go, oh, wow, maybe I'm doing this wrong. Or, or maybe they'll look through your database uh, for your HUD and, and just say, well, you know, some of these percentages are kind of off. Having people like that will never get old. Like they're not the books. <laughs> they're, you know, uh, especially finding players to grow with, like people who are still interested in the game. Um, you can help each other out. And then videos. I mean, videos have taken over books 100%. Um, mm. But even those, like, they're outdated. I, I was, uh, I commentated a little bit the Heads Up match with Doug and Daniel. And um, I had said to one of the Upstream guys, oh, should I, like, should I take the Heads Up course? And they're like, oh, there's a new module out. You should take that one. And I was like, what? They're like, yeah, you know, they started using a lot of solvers in this one. I'm like, oh, my God, like, videos are getting outdated. It's so yeah. wild yeah. that you can, you know, there's so much information. And, and as soon as, someone makes an epiphany like, oh, this is actually the better way to play it. All of a sudden the old way of learning is, is gone. Like Doug had comp had risen to the top without solvers and then now had to reteach himself heads up poker with solvers. This is someone who was at the top three years ago, <laughs> something mm -hmm. like that. So, you know, the game grows really fast. Very quick. Who were your 
key mentors when you came into poker. You look back now and you think, if I had never met this person, I would never have made it as a professional poker player. And what was so special about them? He he would probably die laughing that I'm even going to say his name, but because it was so it was such a funny time. But Steve Ryan, who's still he's just a mid stakes grinder. Um, he was one of the first people I met after um, after getting laid off from my first law job, and I met him at Borgata in a sit and go. He introduced me to uh, a couple really cool people that became my poker friends, and he actually lived in New York City, and I lived in Jersey City, which is like right across the Hudson River. So he's like, hey, you should play in some of these private games instead. Like, why drive all the way down to Atlantic City where you can really drive like 20 minutes over here? Like, all right, sure. And then I spent almost, it's probably a year and a half, maybe two years grinding New York City games and making a bankroll. Um, I would never have found that on my own. I would never have yeah. gone on my own. As a, a single woman uh, who's like early 20s, I'm not going to walk into some crazy basement game by myself. Like, that's just so stupid. I would never do that. Um, so him just kind of like handholding me to being like, oh, this is a really easy five, five game. Like we could play here. And it was fun. Cause I'd meet people, um, in New York and then they'd be like, oh, this person's at this whale is here. Like come. And I'd be like, all right, I'm in Jersey city. I take the train real fast and go play those games. And I don't know if I would have made that kind of money. It wasn't a ton of money, but it was uh, much easier than casinos and gave me some room to kind of play tournaments and everything else where, you know, if I found tournaments first, that's how people go broke instantly. I might have mm. played 10 one Ks and been like, oh, well, time to be a lawyer again. You know, so I feel like Steve Ryan was like really uh, very important for me to meet at that time. And then I've made so many friendships from him because he's like was very much in poker already and introduced me to some of the nicer people in poker. Um, and kind of, I don't know, it's just like a nice way to get a start where it wasn't just going to get thrashed at big expensive games and big tournaments. So there's every moment where there's uh, like an inciting incident where we're all kind of like, is Jamie going to make it? Is Jamie going to make it? <laughs> when, when was the moment that someone would be watching your movie thinking, is she going to make it as a professional Dude, poker Dude, I have player? one of those like every week. Are you kidding me? <laughs> <laughs> In poker, especially because like there have been so many times where I've had bad bankroll management or I've been like, I'm just going to take this shot. If it doesn't go well, I'll just be a lawyer, lawyer again or whatever. I always mm. had that. Um, like a safety net that made it yeah. acceptable in my own mind to do very stupid things. Uh, there were times when I'd have a 20K bankroll and I'm like, I'm going to PCA. Why not? Like that's just for me, I'm like, it's a vacation. If it goes poorly, I, I just go home and, and reevaluate my life. And I had that the first time I ever played the World Series, I brought about $2,000 out. And I like half of that was for hotels and flight. And then I think I played a $300 tournament cash for 2K. And I'm like, sweet, two more weeks. And I just did that the whole entire summer. And I left with, uh, with like a 30 or 40K bankroll. I wasn't good at poker. I just like, I just took chances. And that's the part of the movie where it'd be a very short movie, right? It's like, oh, your first year, see ya. <laughs> you so you had, you had a plan. You, you were like... <laughs> You're like, I'm going to give this poker thing a shot. And if it doesn't work out, I'll just be a lawyer. Yeah. I, don't know. I hope so, right? Else. Like, what else? I, I still think I could be something else. I, I want to have a pit bull rescue one day. That's not like a money making job. But if I ever made a lot of money, that's what I'm going to do for a long time. I don't think people are meant to do one thing for so, let's, our let's lives are long. Down. <laughs> let's poke that let's poke a little bit then because I'm really curious. Okay. So um, I just quit poker, right? So in the last couple of weeks, I've quit poker uh, and I did it because I would, I felt that I, uh, you know, like your law firm, like you, you were like, I just can't do this anymore. Yeah. Like I was the same. Like, I'm like, I just cannot write this article. And my wife's like, just <laughs> yeah. fucking write the article. And it's I'm so like, hard to no, fake no, no, no. interest I, in creative I, things. It's like yeah. almost impossible. Yeah. I'm like, I can't, I can't explain to you. I can't do it. So, so I quit. And then I'm on a high. I'm like, yeah, I could do this, you know. And then all of a sudden, since I've quit, my mind's been like, fuck, I made a bad decision. Um, what if the money don't come in? Boom, 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 boom. And I really have to, like, take care of my mental health, right? Like, mm -hmm. how did you do it? Like, why Why were you – did you go through a similar thing? Or, or were you – how did you crack it? Like, how was you able to just be like, nah, fuck it. I'll be okay. I'll be okay. Like, I still have doubts. I don't know. Like we all do, right? If you say that you're in poker and you're crushing, you still are going to have doubts about how you're using your time. Everyone has like that feeling. Everyone wants to avoid feeling regret later. So I don't know. I know I would have regretted being a lawyer still. You could put $10 million in my bank account. And I'm pretty sure that's all I would have to show for it. It took up a lot of my time and energy. I was not creative. I had no outlets. Like I don't know. I, I didn't enjoy my life. So I know that that was the wrong path. I don't know that poker is the right path. 
Um, mm. Almost any other job I had, I'd take, I'd have more money right now. So if financially that's how I count success, I'd be pretty sad. Um, but also, I don't, I don't know. I feel good. Like the people in my life are good people. Um, they make me happy. I have good conversations. I feel like I'm growing in those ways. I wouldn't have them without poker. So that's like, okay, there, there's things to take from like law school was a bust. Like, why did I do that? It's 150 K. I have my best friend. We still, he's in a, a group. We play mafia role-playing game with all my poker playing friends. I was like, all right, I paid 150 K for a best friend. Cool. That's fine. Like just feeling, I don't know. Like I would just say, I have no like good life advice for you. You probably have way more life experience than me, but I would just say like, stop trying to avoid regret and just like go down whatever path. Like don't regret quitting poker. Cause that's such a waste of time. Like you, mm. I just think after being a lawyer, if I am not a poker player anymore one day and I like try to write or do something like that, um, I just hope I don't waste time like worrying about regretting stuff instead yeah. of enjoying where you are in your life at the time. I don't know. Sorry for the shit answer. <laughs> no, no. I, I mean, I wasn't, I, I wasn't, I didn't, it wasn't advice as such. I was just mm -hmm. curious as to how you're doing it. So what I've done is I've just said to myself, oh, I I desperately need to, I desperately want to go back and re and resecure my job. Mm -hmm. That means I shouldn't go back and resecure my job. Like that's my thought. Fear, right. It's not yeah, like you yeah. miss your job. You're just afraid the next thing is not going to work out. It's from scarcity, not abundance. Right. Mm -hmm. So, so when I got into poker, it was about abundance. It wasn't about scarcity, but now it's scarcity mindset. It's like, I have to, I have to play poker because I'm afraid of something. Whereas um, before it was, I want to play poker and I want to write about poker and I want to interview poker players because I love to do that. Mm -hmm. Like very, very different. And it's very, it is very different to interview someone as it is to sit down and write creative pieces about poker, I find anyway, because we're having a talk about life, not poker. Yeah. So if you, you want me to go, write about life. Down whatever avenue we want. But yeah, I, I understand what you're saying. I've, I've had to do, that was part of it too. Like that's what made me quit being a lawyer is that I had a lot of time by myself writing and editing documents that all looked the same, that were all boring. I'm going through the tax code. I had a lot of time by myself doing that to to really affirm that this is not it. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you know, like yeah, yeah. I'm 12 hours in an office by myself. I'm just like every day, like that wasn't hard. It's not like on a whim. I just went, I don't like this today. I'm out, you know, like, and you've, you've been in poker a long time. You've played poker. You've interviewed poker players. You've written poker mm -hmm. articles. It's not something like, right. It's not like an impulsive thing one day that you're like, no, this isn't for me. Like this has to have been building. No, I, I, I actually came into the industry 10 years ago as a stepping stone to help people beat addiction. So I've been here 10 years. I've been here too long anyway. So I'm <laughs> I'm really proud that I, I got out of it it's, and, um, you know, compassionate with myself that it took so long and it was meant to be, you know. So, okay, so you never you never um, really had a standout inciting incident. What about a refusal of the call? So was there ever a time where um, you, you really – wanted to make it in poker because you didn't want to go back uh, to uh, law, but there was something, the resistance in your mind that was kind of like telling you, you're not going to be able to do this, or there was something about poker that turned you off. Was there ever a time when you was going to turn your back on it completely? Um, I feel like I'm in that kind of mindset this year. Uh, it's just, it's really weird. I, I think all right, well, quarantine has made it so that I've been studying a lot of poker and I've been playing a lot of poker and I feel like it's, I am going to stick around. Um, but I'd say like the year leading up to this was like, it, I don't know, just seeing the writing on the wall, like a lot of really good, smart people are moving on to other things, not because they cannot make a living playing poker, but because poker is going to get harder and maybe their passion is waning a little bit and their brains are still useful in other ways. <laughs> like, you, they can leave and they could go uh, go to Wall Street or whatever. It, it's like whatever you feel like doing. If if money was the thing, there's more money to be made by smart people in other avenues right now. Um, some people left to do creative things. Some people made the amount of money they wanted to make from poker and now they're going to pursue something else. I kept seeing this and like people I really respect and who I know are better players were kind of peeling off and doing other things. And I started to think like, I don't want to be the last one left who's like, clinging on to this being like okay I have to play 40 hours a week to pay rent or something like that like I was like I never want to be there too long you're like the party's over but you're still there <laughs> just like mm -hmm. uh waiting for something to happen I 
I had thought about that a lot. That I was like, I want to leave, but so many little things that have happened in the past two and the past couple of years have like made me more interested in it. Like I really enjoy writing. I, I go straight for some people um, in poker and I like commentating. I think that's really challenging for me. I used to be afraid of public speaking. So like, that's a huge thing for me to grow. Um, I feel like there's like something in it. I don't, I don't know, like outside of playing poker, I just feel like there's still interesting things for me in poker, but that was a, that was for a year. I'm just like, do I want to study? Not really. Do I want to play tonight? Not really. And I kept yeah. doing that. I'm like, well, how long can I do this for and still be able to exist? <laughs> like not very yeah. long. You can't go take six months off of a year where you are your own business. You know, it would just be like, if I had a shop and I'm like, I'm just going to close five days a week. Cause I don't give a shit anymore. Yeah. You're not going to be very successful. So I struggled with that for a year, but it's like nothing huge happened. It was just the realization that people I respect and and admire in poker were kind of choosing different things. And it's like, that's a good wake up call when you have role models in poker and they're all like, oh, I'm done with that. That's in my past. I don't know. I feel like a lot of people at least have noticed that that poker has been changing a lot. And with Sims and stuff, it's like you have to really be on board with studying or you really have to go because you're going to start being a losing player. How did you get into commentary? What was your first commentary gig? How did it come Venice. About? Do you know that? They made me. No, 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 no. <laughs> That's how it happens. That's how it happens most of the yeah. time. I was afraid. Um, I all right, so I was I was class president in high school, which I thought was cool because I got to do a lot of planning and a lot of cool activities and stuff. But then when I had to speak at graduation, my whole entire graduation was ruined because I just was shaking. Like I had my things written down. I'm like, I can't even make words. That's how much I hated it. When I get called in in class, I used to feel clammy and like sick. Um, so then now to be doing commentary is crazy to me. Cause I'm like, okay, now for ESPN, it was like, they said half a million people will watch. I'm like, I used to not be able to speak in front of 10 people. <laughs> it's really <laughs> strange to like get over that. Um, but that was Venice. Like they made me, I was sponsored by party New Jersey and they gave me this awesome trip to go out there. Um, I was just supposed to do some promo stuff for them and commentary was not part of it. And then on the last day they were like, Hey, I don't know if someone, maybe Sam Trickett was supposed to do it or something, but he made the final table. He made the final so, table. Yeah. But they were like, up, Hey, uh, they're like, Hey, can you do commentary for this? And I was like, no. <laughs> and they're like, uh, well, you kind of have to. And I was like, well, you gave me a trip and they gave me a buy in. I can't say no to that. I was like, I'm going to be shit. I'm going to be so bad, but I'll do it. Um, and I went in there and it was with Jesse May and he was so awesome to work yeah, with. He's so nice. And Ben, you came in for a little while just as like a like training wheels for me because I was just like, Jesse May would be like, all right, so what do you think of this river? And I'd be like, uh, I have no thoughts, you know, like I'm so scared. Um, so like Ben, you helped out a little and it was cards down. So it was probably one of the harder commentary jobs I've done even since. Mm -hmm. Um, but leaving the booth, it's not like I've left being like, I'm a natural. I'm so good at this. I crushed it. I left being like, I tried really hard at a thing. I'd be so terrified to do if it was like a few years earlier than that. And I just felt really good about it that I was like, all right, this is cool. Like I got over something, a really big fear, did a decent enough job. Um, and that was it. And I wasn't trying to pursue it, but then when I went back home, Borgata started a live stream. They were partnered with Party New Jersey and they would just throw me in the booth like, oh yeah. And it felt lower stakes after that because Venice was a WPT. I was like, oh my God, I'm so nervous. It was just low stakes. So like, oh, it's a $500 tournament, like hop in there, entertain people. And that's all they told me to do. It wasn't go be the best analyst, go teach people poker. But it was like kind of highlight the players that made it, tell us like some hometown stories about Ben. That was my casino, um, be fun. And that was it. And I just felt like every time I did it, I enjoyed it more. And then when people would ask me to do it, it wasn't like how it was in Venice where I was like, oh, please don't make me do this. I was like seeking out jobs. And mm. I feel like, I don't know, I really, I feel like my voice is a lot different from a lot of people. And some people won't like it because they want like deep analysis of poker. Um, for me anyway, though, when I'm watching streams, I'm like, I like that there are so many different people who do it where I can pull up a stream where it's like, the best poker player in the world teaching me how to get better. And then I'll pull up Stapes and Stapes is like, I have $500 on my hand and mob. I don't give a shit. And he'll just make jokes. I like that too. And I feel like trying to be a combination of those things is really good and different and no women do it at all. Pretty much. There's a couple, but I feel like that is satisfying to me too, to do something that's like that really not other women are doing at all. Did you ever get to it with Jesse again or was it just that one moment? No, it was just then. And I like, I feel sad because I'm like, I feel like I'd be so much more relaxed now. That probably was scary for him too, right? Because I'm just like, hey, I don't know what the hell I'm doing. I'm your partner. No, Good luck. no. Did, 
<laughs> Jesse, Jesse told me a story once, amazing. He, he told me a story. He was going to a gig, and the guy who was supposed to commentate with him didn't turn up, but he had to protect him. So Jesse went ahead with a commentary, pretending that the other guy was in the room. So he didn't just commentate. He kept commentating, going, isn't that right? Isn't that right, Jamie? But anyway, right. Yep. So he was out of free way. He wasn't... He wasn't like pretending he was the voice of the other person, but he pretended like the other person was in and you oh never heard him say anything. Like, That's hilarious. I just, I think with someone like Jesse, for example, like he has a poker knowledge, he has the humor, he mm-hmm. has the balls, he has the everything. I just think he's the greatest, you know, like I'd love That's to see a, more of it. I would rather, like, I really do enjoy um, when someone can lighten the mood. I don't think being a clown is like what people want. I wouldn't want to be looked at as like a clown commentator, but I think yeah. talking about the players and like making sure you're highlighting them because it's their final table. Like no one really cares about the commentators. Usually they really are trying to watch poker. Um, and then like throwing in a joke here and there and like not making it so damn serious is probably a good way to get people who aren't very serious players to enjoy the, the game, you know? They don't but, know what no one wants to feel stupid while they're watching. Like if I'm watching on TV and, and everything's over my head, like that's how I feel. I like UFC, but sometimes I'm like listening to the commentary. I'm like, I don't know what the fuck's going on. <laughs> yeah, well, it's like with soccer in it, you know, like when you have, um, when you have a world cup coming up and in, in the UK, they will pick the world cup team, you know, the world cup team commentary team. Mm-hmm. You know, I remember listening to Glenn Hoddle and I'd be like, Oh, are you fucking serious? I don't want to listen to this guy. Like he's, <laughs> he's fucking brainless and commentary in soccer changed. He used to be like Andy Gray and uh, Keys in the Premier League, and mm-hmm. they would just be very straightforward, right? Like they would, they would just be very analytical about the game. Um, Andy Gray obviously had a lot of experience, but then when it was like Gary Neville and Jimmy Redknapp, um, no, Jimmy Carragher, all of a sudden it would be, oh my god, that is so shit. <laughs> like <laughs> they would just be saying, that is shit. This guy is shit, and I would love it because I'm yeah. like. I respect these guys because they play the game. They just said that this guy's shit. Like, <laughs> this is what it's about. So for me, like, the commentary really does does make a massive difference to to the entertainment for me. Yeah, I like the I like the streams that are a little out of line. Like, Shulman's my favorite because he is the combination of both. He's the combination of like super elite player who who's like smart. I guess like has a good enough EQ to realize how to like take something very high level and make it palatable to someone who doesn't know that much. Like I'm way below him in poker and I still usually understand what he's trying to say um, as far as analysis goes. But then also with like the random phrases, like he has so many funny terms that he makes up um, and like the random jokes and stuff that are just interspersed in some really, really high quality um, elite commentary. He's the best. Like he's someone to aspire to be. Um, But that's also when people complain, like this is one pet peeve I have in poker where someone will commentate and people will be like, oh man, like this guy, like he's not, why don't we get Nick Shulman? I'm like, Shulman can't be on 10 streams at once, guys. Like everyone knows he's the best. Like why, I don't like also that people, when they're giving a compliment, like I recently did the heads up thing and someone was like, I really like your commentary. That's how it started out. And I was like, wow, thanks. Because I thought I did not a great job. Like I'm not a heads up player. And they're like, you're way better than this person and this person. And they put their handles on Twitter. And I'm like, right. I can't even like your tweet now. You're trying to be nice to me, but you can't yeah. just say I enjoyed it without saying, because those other people suck so bad, I enjoy you. Poker does that a lot. We have a really, um, maybe it's just social media, but we have like a really negative kind of community. On- I would I would love to be in a different, I would love to be in a different community just to test whether we have a real problem in poker, because obviously we have this myopic view, right? Mm-hmm. Um but it's definitely, but I'll, I'll write an article, put it out there. And one of the first tweets will always be, who wrote this shit? <laughs> and I think to myself, what on earth possesses somebody to, to do that? Like and my mor- my morals, it? my morals wouldn't let me do it. I know. Like, it just, because you know, the person's going to see it. Like we're small fries. We're going to read, you know, like yeah, I'm, yeah, read I wanna... comment. I'm not like, if I'm, uh, I don't know who's, who's super, if I'm a uh, Helmuth is going to read his comments. It's a bad example. <laughs> Like Nick, Someone... like Nick Nick Rano's not going to really. It's like there's going to be a lot of things go past Nick Rano's eyes because he's got like a half a million followers or something. Right? Yeah, yeah. So like you know he's not going to see this shit. But yeah, I don't know. It kind of you. It, I it, look at it this way. It really helps you to work on your mental health. It really helps you to work on holy shit. 
Why does this person saying I'm a shit commentator or saying I'm a shit writer, why does that bother me? And really yeah. going down that rabbit hole and being able to fix those leaks. That That's why I kind of appreciate that this is harsh because it's helping, it's helping me help you grow, right? Yeah, I think uh, depending on what my mental state is at the time, some things don't, big like big things can can just roll off my shoulders, no problem. Mm. And then stupid comment will get to me one day and I'm just like, damn it, I thought I was doing so much better. Uh, um, but I expect with commentary, especially, uh, it's really funny because it's like I myself, I'm friends with some people whose commentary I don't enjoy. I don't like mm. them less. I just mm. am like, oh, this isn't my cup of tea. Like I like this other commentator better. I don't feel the need to tell them. <laughs> like, yeah, I don't yeah. need to be like, hey, you're a great person, everything, but man, what comes out of your mouth, it's terrible. That yeah. kind of thing. It's like funny when people feel the need to just like tell you that like their opinion is so important. You have to know that you are garbage. <laughs> or, or, or they don't like your commentary, so they don't like anything about you. Yeah. Well, it's like weird everything about this though, Jamie person. <laughs> With commentary and writing both, um, it's so personal. You do like share a lot of yourself. If you're mm. not just doing analysis of poker, you are, it is your sense of humor. It is how you talk about people and all that stuff. So I think, you know, I think it's something very personal when someone's just like, oh my God, you're my least favorite commentary. I hate, oh my God, I hate you. Like that kind of thing would be hurtful. It'd be like if you put a lot of yourself into your writing, if someone says your writing is absolute garbage, that doesn't that hurt on more of a level than just like a professional level? For me, it does, but it, it only hurts because of this childhood wound of external validation. So if I, if I was to get it now, I'd be able to deal with it better. Mm -hmm. but, but definitely in the past, um, it would have really hurt me. Because, I mean, I think about commentary, for example. I've done it, I've done it once in Unibet. They basically asked me to, uh, to write the sidecar with Roy the Boy Brinley. So Roy the Boy Brinley was doing like the commentary for Unibet at the time. And I'm like, can you just be like, I don't know what you call it these days, just like this backup, right? Mm -hmm. Like, I'm like, sure. And then they leave me and there's no Roy. It's like, where the fuck's Roy? And they're like, <laughs> no, no it's, it's just you. I'm like, I didn't even know how to work anything. I'm like, I'm like trying the headset on and, and I got this guy going. <laughs> Nightmare. But I mean, yeah, absolutely not. But commentary is super vulnerable, right? Mm -hmm. So you have to be willing to be vulnerable because you're going to be critiquing at some point or maybe not be critiquing, but you're going to have a viewpoint on what's going on and people are going to yeah. disagree or agree with our viewpoint, right? So, yeah. you know, kudos to you. Who asked you this question? So I'm in this coaching container at the moment and – and, I'm, and I have these two amazing mentors called Zion Kim and Preston Smiles. And I noticed the other day that when I'm coaching people, because I, I help people through addiction and relationships, mm -hmm. when I'm coaching people, I, I realize that I'm sounding like them. I'm, I'm sounding like them. I'm saying things that they say. My pauses are the same. It's like I'm like vicariously living my life through them. Mm -hmm. Like when you commentate, who, who are you? Who are you when you commentate? That's really funny though, because that doesn't that just make you an empath? Like people who are like very empathetic people tend to like mirror the other person and you like take on their cadence because you are kind of like trying to like make them comfortable with like no no I, I don't, don't I no 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 sorry what I mean is what I mean is say you're my mentor and you're coaching you're coaching me and I see you coaching other people I mm -hmm. watch you so when I then coach somebody else I'm sounding like you <laughs> you're not you're not here. But I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm, I've like, I've almost like taken on your voice. So I was curious when you commentate, I, do you find yourself sounding like Nick Shulman or, or do you find yourself? I wish if I could channel that, oh, my problems are solved. I wouldn't even play poker. I would just be Nick Shulman every day. <laughs> 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 so it is funny. There is a lot of adjustment though, like depending on the co-commentator, there's so many different types of people who do this that mm. like I'll hop in the booth and someone's like, oh, it's serious an an analysis day. And I'm like, oh shit. All right. We just talk about every hand. Then there's times I'm in the booth. It's story time, depending who you're with. <laughs> like if I'm with Shulman, uh, we're going to do one actually Monday. I don't know when this comes out, but we're going to do a heads up, Doug Daniel, if they, if they're still continuing it on Monday. Um, and I'm sure it'll be story time. We're both just like goofballs. Like we're friends. <laughs> and when we talk, we like sometimes go off on tangents that are like, we're not on earth. So I think that'll be very funny, but yeah, you kind of do like end up, I don't know if that's a question you're asking, but like you have to like mold to the other person and make sure it's not this uncomfortable, like monologue, monologue, you know, like, cause you can, mm. I've heard that in the booth before people do not jive at all. And you're just like, are they even 
in the same room talking to each other. They don't sound like it. But yeah, I don't know. I'm excited well, for that I, one. I think that'll be fun. It always reminds me of like back in my days on the railway where I had to assess train drivers. So I'd have to go for like a five hour train journey with someone I really despised. And it's just <laughs> you and him in a cab. Terrible. And you can't move anywhere. I can imagine <laughs> that in some commentary circles. It's like, are you fucking serious? You're bringing that guy or that woman in to fucking work with me? I only you know? had that really once. Like, uh, I won't say who it is because I don't want to be mean, but um, it was so bad that I just stopped talking because like, <laughs> I would start saying something and he would interrupt me. And I was right. like, this is so uncomfortable. And I, I didn't know if I was just feeling slighted and uncomfortable, but no, I go on Twitter and it's like, Jesus Christ, let her talk. Like, stop mm. interrupting that girl. Like, everything was like that. And I was like, there were probably several minutes where I said nothing because I just was getting so like just annoyed. And I'm like, it's going to come to a head where I have to tell this person to shut the fuck up. Uh, on <laughs> like, air. That is not what you're supposed to do on commentary. So I just kind of was like, okay, I'm just going to be the quiet person <laughs> in the booth. You, you're going to be uh, Jesse May's missing, uh, missing yeah. co-host. <laughs> I like it. So what, what is the, what's the hardest thing about commentating then? Just being self-conscious is really bad. I think that's a, uh, I had the whole thing with Negreanu, not like my commentary, there's a whole whatever, but that like the, the month or so after that, I was just really self-conscious when I was talking and I'm like, this is not good. Like, that's one thing you have to let go. It's okay to be wrong, um, but you have to be able to take chances and make jokes and even take chances in a hand and like try to figure out why this like elite player is doing what they're doing. Like that is my job when I'm in there. And so when you're self-conscious, like you're just going to do a worse job of everything. Um, and really like lately I've just stopped giving a shit because it's like, I'm hired to do a thing. I'm going to do it. Um, they could have hired other people. So like they want me to do what I do and I'm just going to go in there and do it. Uh, and you know, maybe they regret it and they'd never hire me again if, if that's not what they wanted, but trying to be someone else, trying to be like less fun, more cerebral, more like, analysis heavy that's not what I'm like that's not what I'm at so I think that's the biggest challenge is just like shutting out the fact that like um when I did it in the summer for the for the main event there could be nine good comments that are just like that was fun I liked your comments or whatever and then there'll be one that's just like oh my god does she even know how to play and I'll remember the 10th one and I was like this is mm. so dumb like why are our brains so rigged to just like focus on bad things um, and that, that got to me at first, that was a challenge getting over that. Um, just getting that much attention at once is like a challenge, but I feel like recently I've just been doing jobs I want to do like that are fun. I don't even play heads up. I was in the booth, like talking to someone who does play heads up. So I'm like, all right, so my job is clearly not to teach people how to play heads up. That's um, important. we're going to like tell stories, make jokes. I'll ask questions. I don't understand because mm. I play poker. I'm like, probably the stuff you're wondering at home is the stuff I'm wondering in the booth as someone who's mm. not a heads up professional. So just like, I don't know, like shedding the self-consciousness and talking about the things I think would be interesting to people and not second guessing and not taking comments to heart, either good ones or bad ones, just like ignoring. So Daniel's comments on your commentary threw you for a bit and actually put you in a kind of a little, little mini spiral of self-confidence in yourself. Is that because of who he was? Yeah. And like his, his opinion holds so much weight to people. Um, mm. and I feel like he probably realizes that and doesn't care and just says it anyway. Um, mm. but also it was kind of the thing where if it becomes like, I like doing commentary, not for the money. It's not like, Oh, I'm rich and famous from commentary. Uh, it was more like, Oh, it's a cool little side job that I think is fun. I think my voice is a lot different than other people. I want to share that. It's like a creative outlet. Mm. So when it became an outlet uh, or like I'm getting a lot of bullshit Shit. it's not worth it anymore like that's the no. kind of thing if you wrote uh if you wrote a bunch of articles and they felt good to write but then everyone told you you're terrible every single time um or the most famous person in poker goes Lee Davy is shit hmm. he's banned from this whatever like it would start to become a thing where you're like well there's a lot of bullshit now where before it used to be fun so you kind of just weigh it I'm like this isn't my only job it was kind of like that where I'm just like why do like I left law because it made me unhappy. So then why would I do more stuff that makes me unhappy for less money? <laughs> How did you get over it though? Cause I know you said right now, I don't give a shit, but what was the process in like? Um, just like not letting some person I don't like control my life. Like, <laughs> but was there, was there, kind of did, did you, did you journal? Did you talk to friends? Did you look in the mirror and say, fuck this guy? Like what happened? Like, or, or did, or you just like go with the flow and eventually you just, you just climb in the ring and, 
Um, I really think I'm just a very stubborn person. I, I, I have always been like, if you told me I wasn't going to make Rutgers soccer, I was going to make it like that right. was it where my dad was like, why don't you take a soccer scholarship to another division one school? I had one to Wagner and I was like, I'm going to make it. And like the mm. doubt put on me made me insane. I was like, I'm making this. I kind of feel like that is like, I, I know it's not the healthiest way to find motivation, but I, I operate off of spite. (laughs) So that kind of does motivate me. Like I've studied more poker in the last, like, I want to say three or four months than probably in my whole poker career combined, like poker used to be easier. You didn't have to study as much, but really after the commentary thing, after like the little spat with him, I was like, screw you, dude. Like, uh, (laughs) uh, like you can't tell me I'm not good at this thing. It's a subjective thing. Other people like it. Sorry, you don't like it, but getting good people talk about poker players. Like, they're good or bad at poker. And it's like, it's fluid. Like you could be good right now. And if you do nothing for two years, you're bad. Um, Same with commentary. I'm like, there are people who've grown on me so much. There are people who were bad at commentary and then they got good at poker and now they're good at commentary. Like that, Mm -hmm. the thing is, it's, it's just weird to define people and like kind of stunt their growth in certain areas like it's a thing where it's like oh immutable you were born lee davy you're born being a good uh article writer or you're not like that kind of thing well, uh, I, feel like this, people like that. I mean around poker especially around comedy the way i've seen it on the live tour i don't know just just for people if i don't know if people are aware of this he's probably changed a lot now but the way it used to happen was nobody wanted to fucking commentate so what would happen <laughs> is the tours would be begging people like Jamie in Venice and mm-hmm. say, please, can you do this? So think about this, folks. If it weren't for people like Jamie going, oh, my God, I really don't want to do this, but I'll do this, <laughs> you wouldn't have any commentary, right? And then we don't. I don't think our minds work like, oh, my God, I'm doing commentary now, so I need to go to commentary school. I need to read commentary <laughs> books. I need to watch commentary people. I don't think it really works like that, you know, until yeah. all of a sudden someone says, you're fucking shit, and you're like, Okay, I'm gonna prove this guy wrong. But it, yeah. it's, it it doesn't work like that, does it? You know, it's not like that. No, you can improve in poker. I feel like that's my the only reason that that certain comments get to me is because I I agree. You know, like if mm. if someone says yeah, the mirror, uh, there's a mirror up. Yeah, that's the thing. Mm. It's like you people say some pretty horrible things on Twitter. I don't really care because I I don't take it to heart. Um, mm. Pretty much, I've been in poker a long time, um, and I've never taken it quite seriously enough. I've always just tried to make a little bit of money. I've been hanging out in the mid-stakes uh, for a long time, and I've just been like, whatever, I'm enjoying my life. This is what I want to do. But that does, like, that is lacking in commentary. Like, if I'm if I'm commentating on someone who has 10 million in earnings and they're playing 25Ks and stuff, the best I can do is guess why they're doing it, you know? Mm-hmm. Like, I'll be like, oh, I think Alex Foxen is doing this because whatever. Um, but, you know, if I was a lot better at poker, I would have better commentary to offer. But what you're saying is 100% true. Those people are not commentating. Their hourly is better playing the tournament. So yeah, 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 it yeah, is yeah. necessarily like that, that you aren't going to get the top 0.1% poker player to be commentating on most streams because they would have to get paid a lot of money. <laughs> like Phil yeah. Ivey's not hopping in the booth anytime soon. No, but things that things are changing a little bit, but like we try and stuff, you know, they're, they're looking after their, they're looking after their talent and they're paying them good money. And so now you, now you can see a career in broadcasting and it can streaming helps with that as well. I think is people can look at it, the whole streaming broadcasting sideline mm-hmm. reporter thing suddenly becomes an attractive outlet because it can lead to other things as well. It doesn't, often do that but it can lead to other opportunities right yeah and there's just so many different ways it's just like poker you can go do a free commentary stream if you wanted to see if you're good at it you can have a twitch stream if you want it to be very low stakes and see if you have talent for commentary or if you like a drive to do it you love doing it and then move up with like little what little paid gigs and then someday like bigger ones um and by that time you've had a lot of practice and like that's kind of what i i did a lot of little jobs first and that's why it was like so weird like daniel's like you don't just put some new person in the booth and i was like new person like i'm sorry you didn't watch like a hundred streams i did but Mm. i don't know i just say i hate when someone's opinion overrides everything that anyone else can say and that is what it's like when someone has a very loud voice in poker that's just gonna happen like i'm i'm more aware of it having been on the receiving end of it that Mm. we're like i don't even like picking on twitter trolls like that used to be, yeah, yeah, you yeah, know, yeah. I'd be like, oh, I could get this guy. I'm going to have like the best joke. But I'm like, oh, this person's like 50 followers 
And they like said something to me, do I need to put this person on blast because I have the power to put them on blast and ruin yeah. their whole night? I'm like, no, probably not. Like just try not to be a bullying asshole. That's like a good, mm. <laughs> good way I to I like it. Life. I like it. Um, <laughs> how did it feel to be on World Series Pokemon event though? Oh, that was terrifying. <laughs> 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 I had done it. So uh, I had a really positive experience the year and the, I think two years before I'd done day one a and day one b um and that was like awesome like i i had done a bunch of twitch streams and maury eskandani was like oh i want to give you a shot like i think you're really funny and you'll do a good job and they played with lon and norm and it was so much fun and like, we got along great i feel like we played off each other really well and uh i heard only good things people were like oh that was really fun to watch like you're funny and all this stuff like there's never oh my god your poker analysis is so insightful i've never gotten those comments but i get like the you're fun to watch i was like all right hmm. so the next year same thing but they had me do another like it was like day one a, a day one b like day two and day three maybe something like that and that was cool the last year was the only time that it was like actually a bad experience because it was so scary like i did so many days straight i think it was like nine days straight of commentary which is like a million hours it was so mm. exhausting but also um the final table is just so different from the preliminary days because there's just so much like fanfare around it. I had to do an on-camera part, which I'm like, I'm the most awkward person ever. Uh, it was on TV the other day and I was like, turn it off. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't want to see so it. so bad. Like I'm reading a teleprompter. It's like, I don't know how to read it. It is so bad. Um, so that's like mortifying, but the actual, uh, there's just more pressure. It was like, I put yeah. it on myself, but I also know way more people watch it. I know people pay attention to that because they're just like, oh, is this the best person we have for this spot? It's like, no, like Shulman would have been the best. He had like a fight with like ES Ken before that. And and I don't know, there was just, there's like little things that all added up to it being a negative experience instead of positive. Whereas mm -hmm. like the preliminary days, the other years I had a blast. I thought it was like, I was so nervous going in and then I just had so much fun. This was a little rough. So I don't know. I wasn't feeling like myself and I was feeling... I don't know, watching the players, I like, didn't want to over criticize. I didn't want to like interject any things because I was like, I'm not sure of myself. I'm not playing 100Ks, you know? So that was kind of tough. But also, it's really weird to talk about external validation. That was all the external validation in the world. Like, people I haven't talked to in 10 years were like, oh my God, you were just commentating on ESPN. That's so cool. And I'm like, oh, the one yeah. thing I don't feel great about is what I'm getting all this positive reinforcement from like, old friends and family and stuff my extended family thought it was the coolest thing in the world yeah it's that perspective right it's like we <laughs> yeah. think like it's the world's worst thing and you know like we've talked about many times in the last 90 minutes there's a, a lot of beautiful stuff that comes out an incredible pile of shit right so yeah. I'm, I'm sure that you will uh in the future, in another interview, you'll be looking back at that going, that's one of the most pivotal moments of my life. Well, it's a learning experience. It's like what you're talking about, dealing with criticism. Um, there's been a lot of studies that I've, I've read where it talks about like how much the world has changed, that we're all on a stage, that we're on social media, that everything yeah. we create reaches so many more people than it used to. And that our our like brains are not made for dealing with that much attention. Like we're used to being in a tribe where maybe 20 people are judging you in mm -hmm. high school, maybe a couple hundred people. You're not getting random strangers comments on every move you make um, growing up. And then with social media, I feel really bad for kids right now because it, they're everywhere. They're on a stage from the time they're like five years old. Mm -hmm. um, I think that's like very hard for your brain to process. Like I didn't like all the attention. Like a lot of it was good. And I was still just like, ugh. like just being judged, you feel self-conscious. Like you feel like you have to choose your words really wisely and the filter is on and all that stuff. And I'm like, I didn't enjoy that. And I feel like reflecting on that, it's just the people I like the most seem to have no filter. It's like, maybe I should hear from that. You know, the ones who, maybe they say dumb shit sometimes. But whatever, like I still like them. So maybe that's like a better way to live your life than to be so self-conscious. What I'm learning at the moment is, uh, you know, the more haters you have, the more likely is you're stepping out of your comfort zone and really challenging yourself. So, Jamie, yeah. thank you for the last <laughs> 90 minutes sharing your hero's yeah, journey. Don't leave poker. What are you doing? <laughs> yeah, I'm gone. I'm gone. Oh, oh, no, I just, you did, as you were talking to me, I, it did give me an idea of how I can stay in. So... Let's see. What is that? Do you want to share it, or is it like a spoiler? <laughs> well, I I don't want to I don't want to write about poker, but I I I want to write about life, and I want to mm -hmm. help poker players improve their life. So I'm a little bit like you, like like um I wouldn't focus on like 
you know, dissecting the, the technical aspects of a 25K, but I can look at a guy and go, well, there's a guy with a, a, an absolute addiction issue or that's a guy mm -hmm. with a problem with his wife and I, I can help with that. So I can, I can remain in poker writing about that stuff um, rather than writing about biopics about people that I don't really want to write about. So I'm going to give it a punt. I'm going to see if they'll take it and let's see what happens. Yeah, awesome. Yeah. Well, All thank right. you. This is fun. This is like a therapy session. <laughs> <laughs> I enjoyed it, Jamie. It's really good speaking to you. You too. Um, and uh, take care of yourself, yeah? You too.